Now that's why Malcolm put an X on it. I mean, Elijah put an X on the brother's name. You were a Negro, Malcolm Little. Now you a black man, you're Malcolm X because you don't know who your slave master was who named you Little. He was probably called Mr. Big and called you Little. But you just an X. You just an X, just unknown. So Elijah knew what he was doing. We got problems with Elijah on other fronts in terms of thinking about white brothers and sisters as devils. He wrong to do that. But that was his way of keeping track of the devilish behavior of white brothers and sisters. He had a lot of evidence for that. He just made the wrong ontological inference. You can keep track of devilish behavior and people are still human beings. But he made it, well, devilish behavior must be devils. Well, that's pushing it, Elijah. That's going too far. <laughs> just keep track of the devilish behavior. You all see the point I'm making? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Doctor, let me ask sort of a related question, and that is that uh, is there a way for a kind of a populism to bring back the legitimate concerns of the feminists who have been wronged for centuries and blacks as we're still going for the same piece of the pie, which is equal pay, equal opportunities, and all of that. When it comes to the colleagueship of feminists and blacks, is there a way that that dialogue can be built without the, the, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. legitimate forces tearing it down? Mm -hmm. No, I think to begin with Angela Davis is important here. You think of people like Bell Hooks, I'm sure. I hope you all read Bell Hooks' work and, and Patricia Collins and others. To begin with Angela Davis, because if you begin with black women as central, then you'll never talk about women and mean only white sisters. Or you never talk about black folk and mean only black brothers, you see. So that the invisibility of black women in the dialogue of race and gender, and of course class and empire is very important here in its backdrop, uh, uh, is, is called into question. So somebody like Angela Davis her example is what? Her example is there has to be a new wave of black womanist activism and leadership that provides a vision that not just embraces all, but acknowledges that the black woman never will be invisible again. You see what I mean? And that's crucial. That's crucial. Uh, and Angela is someone who has been so concerned about issues of class and white supremacy and male supremacy and empire and so forth. Bell Hooks has been another that, the, uh, uh, that if you begin there, I think you're gonna get much further down the road than the clashes with these categories at, at an abstract level that are really often implicitly alluding to homogeneous communities that, are, that have excluded people already. You see. Uh, um, and there's no doubt in my mind that the, uh, the next wave of high quality leadership, including high quality black leadership, will come from sisters of all colors. And it's partly because, uh, um, it's partly because we, uh, you know, we brothers, we, uh, we're in crisis. Uh, I know some of the brothers saying, you just talking about yourself, Negro. No, <laughs> but, uh, no, but we, we really are in crisis. Uh, uh, it, it, it's part, it's partly, it partly has to do with the, um, the crisis of the family, it partly has to do with the crisis in the workplace. Uh, we haven't said a word about the criminal industrial complex, but that's very important. That's very important in terms of the impact on, uh, on, on, on black male identity, uh, the uh, differential treatment of so many uh, young, poor black brothers who are, uh, constitute cannon fodder for the system. You know, with the white brothers and sisters use drugs what, five times as much, black folk only 12% of the population, 65% of the convictions, you see. Uh, uh, and that's been going on for generations, so you got transgenerational overlay of that, yeah. over and over again. And, it's, and, it's, and because of the male impact on it, it's not just that the absence of, the relative absence of black men from the family, but all of that creative imagination, intelligence, and slices of genius in the prison does influence what's going on outside. 
You can't understand hip hop without understanding what's going on in the prison just in terms of the baggy pants they wear. That's prison culture. I taught in prison for 27 years, and the waves are just, it's, it's unbelievable. That's the thing when Brother Barack gave that speech in Philadelphia. I was, I was critical of him. He said, well, you know, Reverend Jeremiah Wright is angry because he's older generation. The younger generation not angry. I said, no, 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 no. Which black folk you talking about? These young black folk I teach in prison, 18 years old, they scare the prisoners who are 35. They make Bigger Thomas's rage and Richard Wright's native son look calm and serene. That's how deep it is. That's what happens when you have chronic and systematic neglect at the spiritual, social, cultural, and political level of any people, of any color. That's what happens, you see. And that's what we're dealing with. And that the symbol of that is young black brothers. You see what I mean? And so I find it's difficult, even for a black man in the highest place in American empire, not to be affected by what our precious brother Jamal on the block is doing. Even in terms of the white normative gaze that's keeping track of you as you go up. They got Jamal in mind. That's how connected it is. And I think morally, of all colors, we ought to be concerned with Brother Jamal. And again, I don't want to stereotype Jamal, because Jamal's a complicated brother. He's just making some bad choices. <laughs> making some bad choices, as too many young brothers are, you see. And so the brothers in deep crisis, and the, uh, the sisters are, uh, many are in crisis, but they're, they're flowering and flourishing much more. I mean, you go to the colleges now, it's 80%, 20%, black women, black men. 90%, 10%, 70%, 30%, generation after generation after generation. And those sisters standing up, ready for leadership, moving into our pulpit. Yeah. I mean, that, that upsets some patriarchal <laughs> folk now. Oh, yeah. yes. Oh, you see, even, even Sister Palin's uh, people having to work with that, you know. Mm -hmm. Are you willing to vote for uh, your... Your, your church member, vice president, but you can't have a woman in the pulpit? Well, uh, yeah, that's a little paradoxical, isn't it? Uh, well, if John McCain were to pass and she would be president, but she couldn't preach in your pulpit, but she's president of the United States? Well, yeah, we're gonna have to work that one too. Uh, uh, I see, I see, I see. Oh, uh-huh. You got to work with that contradiction. And I'm just not saying that just against Sister uh, Palin. That's true for many churches, different colors, different cu cultures. The difficulty of trying to depatriarchalize our churches. Very difficult thing. Brothers don't like to give up power. For some of them, that's the only thing they got. They haven't been washed in the blood. <laughs> they hold on to power. Anybody holding on to power in the form of idolatry. You need to learn how to step out on something and land on something, meet a God who teach you how to fly. Yeah. I don't want to start getting too fired up up here, though, brother. <laughs> <laughs>